Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, Kobe and I chat with Dmitry Kravatovich, researcher at Ethereum Foundation, Dusk Network, and ABDK Consulting, and JP Omosan, CSO at Taurus. We compare symmetric and asymmetric cryptography and then dive into hash functions. We discuss the process of developing and improving hash functions and explore what it means for a hash function to be ZK friendly. Now, before we start in, I want to share that one of our ZK Summit partners, Alio, are currently in their third incentivized testnet phase. Alio allows for programmable privacy, and with this testnet, developers can now build their own private and scalable applications. If you want to try it out, check out their repo at github.com slash AlioHQ and look for Snark OS. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Anoma. Anoma is a set of protocols that enable self-sovereign coordination. Their unique architecture facilitates the simplest forms of economic coordination such as two parties transferring an asset to each other, as well as more sophisticated ones like an asset agnostic bartering system, involving multiple parties without direct coincidence of wants, or even more complex ones such as N-party, collective commitments to solve multipolar traps, where any interaction can be performed with an adjustable zero-knowledge privacy. Anoma's first fractal instance, Namada, is planned for later in 2022, and it focuses on enabling shielded transfers for any assets with a few-second transaction latency and near-zero fees. Visit anoma.net for more information. So thanks again, Anoma. Now here is a dive into hash functions with JP and Dimitri. Today, Kobe and I are here with JP Omosan, CSO at Taurus, and Dimitri Kovratovic, researcher at Ethereum Foundation, Dusk Network, and ABDK Consulting. We're going to be talking all about hash functions. So welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having us. Hi, Anna. Great to be here. And hi again, Kobe. Thank you for joining me on this episode. I know we're going to go deep into the tech, so I'm very glad that you're here with, the, with us. Happy to be here. Okay, I want to get to know both of you. Uh, let's start with you, JP. You are CSO at Taurus. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing, what you've been working on, and what led you to work on hash functions. Sure. Uh, so I've been doing cryptography for maybe 15 years, so way before blockchain, way before ZK proofs were practical. And I was not much interested in ZK proofs at the time, 10 years ago. Uh, I was mostly interested in symmetric crypto and in particular hashing. So I started doing um, hash function work during my PhD between 2006 and 2009, where I submitted a hash function called Blake to the Shastri competition. So maybe you're familiar with the hash function Blake 2 and Blake 3. Yeah. So these two come from the original Blake design. Cool. Uh, I also design other hash functions. Maybe the best known is also SIPHash, which is ironically not a hash, strictly speaking. And I also work together with Dimitri, who's here, on hash functions optimized for passwords, what we call password-based hashing. And this led to the design called Argon 2. So fast forward to today, I'm... CSO, so Chief Security Officer of a company called Taurus. Uh, it's a Swiss fintech, so essentially what we do is the technology, software, and hardware that banks are using to manage digital assets, so cryptocurrency, stablecoin, tokenized securities, and the like. So I'm not doing purely crypto, also a lot of personal security, but I keep you know, a foot in the crypto research. I keep attending conferences, doing research, giving talks, and podcasts like this one. Cool. And actually, we met for the first time when you, I mean, I, I got to know your work when you spoke at ZK Summit 7. There you were talking about like auditing ZK systems and stuff. Would you say part of your work is audits? Sure. I've been doing a lot of security consulting and in particular, uh, vulnerability research, God audits, God reviews. And since maybe 2014, 2015, a lot of uh, security audits, security assessment for blockchain applications, so wallets, um, consensus protocols, um, new ciphers, you name it. And the last year or two, I've been working on auditing ZK proof systems, which was, like I mentioned in my talk, the most interesting and the most challenging 
topic. So, you know, when you have all these crypto components working together, hash functions, ciphers, polynomial commitments, pairings and the like, it's so complex, but super interesting. Cool. Dimitri, tell us a little bit about your journey and what you've been working on. Sure. Well, I hate to say that, but my journey is pretty similar to that of JP. I did my PhD at about the same time and it was devoted to pretty much the same topic with a little bit difference that I was, yeah, I, was, I did symmetric cryptography at that time as well, but I was not that much on the design side. I was on the easier side. I was at the side of breaking things. So so-called cryptanalysis and I, with my PhD co-authors and with my supervisor, we broke a number of uh, ciphers and hash functions, and we didn't participate in the SHA-3 competition, but we continued working on the analysis, and then we started a little bit of the design, and that's how we designed first this winner of the password hashing competition that JP hosted at that time, that the winner was Sargon2, and it's now used in many different applications of password hashing. Then at pretty much about the same time, at about 2013, we started looking at Bitcoin. What was, well, like, well before Ethereum uh, started to exist. And we uh, studied various uh, anonymity properties of Bitcoin. And then I did like more and more research in the area of blockchain. And well, this was not like m much about uh, zero knowledge. I think up to the year 2018, when I was still doing uh, design and analysis of symmetric primitives, and I was just found a paper about Starks. And in this paper about Starks, uh, Eli Ben Sasson with co-authors, uh, they suggested using a hash function based on block cipher AES. And what was uh, really nice about this hash function is that it was the design that I broke exactly 10 years ago. And this paper wasn't Ooh. published because it was not so interesting. So people said, well, who would like decide to use a hash function based on AES if we have like much better hash function? So this result was not published in 2008, uh, but it became useful in 2018. And uh, since then I started to look into zero knowledge space. And uh, on the wave of this interest, I joined Ethereum Foundation as a researcher. And uh, yeah, we do a tremendous amount of cryptography research uh, at the frontier of crypto at Ethereum. And I do a little like more practical stuff at uh, Dusk Network where I develop uh, some concrete uh, protocols that use zero knowledge on a daily basis because it's privacy oriented uh, blockchain and I also do consulting in my own company, BDK Consulting, which we founded with my wife in 2016 and uh, working also with my friend Mikhail there. So we indeed do audits of a lot of things, including zero knowledge protocols and, and circuits. So it's kind of, we design things uh, at my first work and then audit the implementation of this thing uh, at my kind of second and third work. That's kind of pretty amazing. You do kind of, you get uh, money twice for pretty much the same job. <laughs> and nice. maybe one thing you did not mention, uh, maybe the pinnacle of our careers or biggest achievement is when Dmitry and I collaborated on attacking Ketsak, which is now known as Chess3. And there was a cryptographic competition just to break Ketsak. We did not break it, but we had the best attack and we won a crate of Belgian Trappist beers. Okay. Um, which was very, very fun, by the way. <laughs> I want to double check something. You just mentioned that in the Stark paper, they were using a type of hash function that you had already broken or you had like figured out the vulnerability of. So did that force them to change it? Yes. So what actually happened is that uh, they designed a Stark for a um, non-traditional field. It's not like a big prime field we're still using now, but they looked into smaller binary fields and they select it as a hash function uh, kind of tailored for this field, a hash function based on the block cipher, AES. Block ciphers and hash functions are somewhat similar, but they also different in security properties. Block ciphers are somewhat smaller. And in order to not to fall into the trap of small security level, you have to make sure that you, this smaller state uh, doesn't pose extra vulnerability. And what the Stark paper did, they made it into a hash function in the most straightforward way. 
And this straightforward way was insecure because it added uh, degrees of freedom, I would say, that can be exploited by an adversary in order to mount, for example, a collision attack. So these degrees of freedom are uh, unavailable in a block cipher setting because basically what they did, they said, okay, so in the block cipher, there is a key which is secret and there is a message you encrypt. And they say, okay, let's be both message that you hash, a uh, key and, and the message. And it gives you kind of the freedom in the key that you didn't have in the cipher setting. And because of that, uh, this resultant function becomes um, really vulnerable. And we found this property uh, back in 2008 when we tried to attack AES and related designs. And I, I was reading the paper like late nights uh, and I immediately, pretty much the same night, wrote to Ellie and said, well, guys, you, you're, you're doing something really wrong, so you should have used a different hash function. And Ellie replied, well, if you, if you think you should use, we should use a different hash function, uh, couldn't you suggest a different hash function? And I said, yes, so we, we certainly can do it. Uh, we, I have a team, we can do the job. Yes, it was the, the year of 2018, so it turned out that uh, already at the time, Ellie uh, covertly collaborated with another team from, from Belgium who designed a different hash function for them. It, it's called, it was called Friday, and they present, presented it around uh, Difcon uh, in Prague. And the thing is, pretty much the second day after this design was present, me and uh, colleagues of mine from Austria and from Great Britain, we found some real good vulnerability oh, man. in this uh, hash function. This is such an interesting way to do business development. I feel like that's the job of the auditor. Like you, you break stuff. You're just like, are you sure you want to work with them? You sure you don't want to work with us? <laughs> Broken. <laughs> right. So we indeed uh, found the vulnerability and published a paper about it. And that's made the Stark team to switch from this Friday setting to something new. They actually did decided to run a competition in around 2019. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, and our new hash function, Poseidon, was one of the entrants to this competition. And uh, the sad news, like the one year, uh, one year later, they told us, well, there was like a third party crypto analysis from, from France. And they said, well, French guys decided that your Poseidon thing is not really the best one. So. This second design from Belgians is better. So we decided to use not Poseidon, but the rescue hash function. So we said, why so? Yeah. It's like a thousand times slower. And yeah, and just two years ago, we were kind of devastated. We invested a huge amount of time into designing Poseidon, optimizing it here and there. And then they said, well, we, of course, uh, you did a great job, but we are selecting rescue. But it turned out they, they oh. did select rescue, but they are kind of unselecting it right now, I think. Oh, gossip. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people use Poseidon today, right? Yeah, so. well, they couldn't uh, tolerate the, the sloth of rescue. So from the security standpoint, it, it was somewhat like a little bit better, but not like tremendously better. Uh, but from the plain performance ratio, so Poseidon couldn't be beaten at that moment. And I think mm. this made people using it. I want to take one step back into something both of you said. You talked about symmetric cryptography versus, and I'm guessing versus asymmetric. Can you actually define that for us? What's symmetric cryptography and what falls under that? So symmetric is all the crypto primitives, because we talk of primitives, you know, the core building blocks as opposed to protocols. So asymmetric is everything that is not asymmetric. And asymmetric is also called public key. So as soon as you have a public key and a private key, whereby you can generate the public key from the private key, but not the other way, you're in the realm of public key, KAI asymmetric crypto. And typically this involves you know, mathematics, security proofs, and relatively slow operations. So RSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve, this is all asymmetric. Uh, whereas block ciphers, stream ciphers, hash function, PRFs, it's symmetric and fast. And I guess ZK falls in asymmetric as well. Actually, both, uh, okay. both components. So a lot of ZK proofs rely on the harness of problems such as DLP, so this discrete logarithm problem, which is at the core of many public key systems. But at the same time, you have a lot of hash functions and hash function-like 
algorithms in, in ZK proofs. And typically you have people so like me and Dimitri, we are more in the symmetric crypto world because it's a different set of techniques, maybe different skills, different communities. So there's traditionally this separation between the public key and the secret key or symmetric community. Hmm. It doesn't mean we don't know anything about public key, but that we are more specialized in, uh, in symmetric stuff. Cool. It's also a bit different about how the field approaches into adopting new schemes and protocols, right? Like you mentioned all the time, the competition that you have for new hash function, right? For Blake to when, when it was in the competition for SHA-3 and this competition for uh, the new hash function that would be used for Starks and so on. So for example, why was there even competition for SHA-3? Like well, what's wrong with SHA-2, right? Well, the, the history of this uh, is the following. So just for the background, maybe not everybody knows this concept of crypto competition. So it's like a destruction derby. You submit your algorithm and you try to break other people's algorithm without breaking yours. And it's organized by the US agency NIST, so the National Institute of Standard and Technology. It's the agency in charge of doing US federal standards. But what happens in practice is that what NIST standardizes becomes a worldwide de facto standard, so except for national standards. Uh, and NIST organized this for the, the AES block cipher to supersede the death cipher in, the, um, in the 1998. And the reason why they organized a SHA-3 competition is because SHA-2 was not broken, but the fact that SHA-1 was broken and SHA-2 was very similar to SHA-1 in terms of design, in terms of operations, uh, in terms of the people who designed it, it made a lot of people nervous. Like, you know, what if, what if it gets broken? So it's like an insurance. And it was also as a byproduct, we got better, more original, faster designs. Like if you look at Blake 2, well, Blake 2 was not strictly speaking a competitor. I designed it after because I was a bit pissed that Blake lost. I was like, okay, fuck it. Oh. <laughs> I will do Blake 2, <laughs> which I believe is superior to Kitsak in terms of engineering. And then people started to use it. But yeah, that's the, the short story. That I actually didn't understand from your original story that you you are behind Blake and Blake too, not just that's Blake. Right. And then, and was is is there a Blake three? Like, at what point do you stop? Is it because of the competition? <sighs> like, oh, we're winning right now, so we don't need to go further. Or like, yeah, what what defines how far well, you go? The, you know, the thing with hash functions is the simplest crypto algorithms to design ever. It's relatively easy to design a, a secure hash function. Uh, and I could teach you in 10 minutes how to do it, and you would design a very secure hash function. Cool. What is, what is hard is to design something that is secure, but as fast as possible. Because the faster you go, the fewer operations you make. So the less security, quote unquote, you have. So the game is to find the right trade-off between security, security assurance, you know, confidence in the security, because as some people say, attacks always get better. Uh, so between security assurance and speed for different notions of speed, it can be speed on software, speed in hardware, and speed as a circuit, as an arithmetic circuit, which is the reason why we have these different families of hash functions like Poseidon Rescue, which are algebraic, which are, you know, ZK circuit oriented mm. hash functions, uh, very different from SHA-3 and Blake and the like. I would actually add that this landscape of hash function usage and this performance competition, it has changed significantly with the introduction of vector instructions in modern CPUs, because the designs of hashes that came in late 90s and in the early zeros, they were like sequential. They didn't make use of parallel of, or vector instructions. They couldn't work on really long memory words like 128 or 256 bit. And at some point it was difficult to compete if you are a sequential design, but if you start designing something which can be easily parallelized or vectorized like JP's design, Blake 2 and Blake 3, you easily beat uh, this old stuff by I think factor of 10 or, or even more. And you so quickly become much faster, you so quickly become not a bottleneck anymore in any application that would potentially use a hash function that you could use your hash functions slower than it could be, but much more secure. 
This kind of means that instead of like making it like 10 times faster, we make it only five times as fast, but twice more secure. And the security margin, uh, which you have in your hash function between like the best possible attacks and the actual design is so big that people even don't start bothering trying to attack it. So because of that, we see quite little progress in crypto analysis of traditional hash functions that they become kind of so fast that we can in introduce much bigger security margin into them and uh, they are not uh, a bottleneck. Yeah, that's a great point. And this leads me to the answer to an asked question. Uh, why Black3? So the difference between Black2 and Black3 is that Black2 is employing this, you know, parallelism, um, CPU core level parallelism, whereby you do several instructions at the same time in the same CPU core, potentially, where you have different arithmetic units or you have vectorized instructions. Uh, Black3 goes one step further. It exploits multi-core computing. So you have a parallelism instead of in the sense of using multiple cores at the same time. So the more cores you have, the faster you you can be. And it's also acceptably fast if you have a single core. I want to ask you a question about like ZKPs and hash functions, because you talk about like ZK friendly hash functions, but I'm just realizing that like, I'm not entirely clear where they work together. Is it in the engineering using ZKPs or is it in the Z, like in the circuits themselves where this, these hash functions are actually being used? I think well, we can simply say they're used in two uh, capacities. So one usage is uh, directly in circuits, uh, something like you design a protocol, an algorithm that uses a hash function and then you build a circuit of it and you prove that the algorithm works correctly and at some place inside the protocol, there is a hash function. For example, uh, you prove a set membership in the Miracle tree. You prove that you know a leaf in the Miracle tree and you, you prove that there is a path from a leaf to the root in this Miracle tree. And this is used for some kind of set membership. For example, you prove that you, you are in the white list of possible traders uh, of some crypto asset or you prove like in Zcash that uh, you own a coin in, in some tree and this coin has not been spent yet. So the, here hash function is just part of the algorithm, part of a circuit. Recently emerged another usage and this one in recursive, I would say simply recursive snarks in uh, incrementally verifiable computation schemes, uh, which are based on recursively applying ZK snark uh, to parts, to chunks of a computation. And inevitably, you have to use a hash function at every step because, well, what happens is that you have to construct some challenges uh, in order to compress uh, the chunks into kind of a single piece of a computation that you verify succinctly. You compress, and in order to prove that you have compressed correctly, you have to use a challenge. And in order to generate the challenge, you have to use a hash function and you have to have all of it inside your circuit because you do it recursively. And because of that, uh, hash function started being used as part of uh, recursive snark proof. Again, this is, can be in the form of a miracle tree, but it doesn't have to be the miracle tree. It can be like anything that helps you to generate the challenge or to prove that you open a commitment. If your commitment is based on Miracle trees, then you use a Miracle tree circuit, but it doesn't have to uh, be based on it. Based on that great overview, concretely, what it means for the hash functions, why do we need to use different hash functions for these applications? So I would say there's maybe two main aspects from a technical perspective. So Dmitry mentioned that you have hash functions into circuits. So you have a program and you express the program as a circuit. So you want a hash function that is small in the sense of having very few elements of the circuits. So typically um, constraints, uh, that's one thing. So if you take SHA-3 or Black2 or KSAC, they're not designed to minimize the number of constraints. They're designed to be fast on software. So they will not be optimal for that uh, circuit use case. And the second aspect is that oftentimes we work with um, you know mathematical structures, typically finite fields. And we process elements of finite fields. 
So if you look at the general hash function, it just works with bytes. So you would have to translate finite field elements into bytes and the other way, which in itself is also error prone and a bit costly. So ideally you want hash functions that rely on field elements because field elements is the, that's the native language of many proof systems. Just to check that, like, so are you saying that if you're using hash functions in recursion versus using hash functions within a circuit, you would actually use different ones? Like you wouldn't use the same one for both because they don't have the same properties? You may use a different one for recursion. Uh, for example, if your recursion implies you have to compute a whole miracle tree uh, and prove well formation of this miracle tree in a recursion. So not just, so your circuit uh, that you prove in the recursion consists not of like a single path in a tree, but of a tree, of a full tree. And this also means you have to compute this tree while making a proof. So in applications like set membership, you compute this Miracle tree like in Zcash, you compute it like incrementally. But if you, for example, decide to compute a Miracle tree for like four, several million of transactions, instantly that will take you quite some time. And in recursion, if uh, you're supposed to compute a Miracle tree over quite big number of data blobs, like hundreds of thousands or something, then it becomes a bottleneck by itself. So not like, not just the proof time, but uh, the moment where you have to compute the Merkle tree first before you even open some elements in this. And when uh, you face the problem of computing the Merkle tree fast, then your hash function must be fast enough for your uh, prover to sustain. For example, this happened in this uh, fractal recursion scheme uh, where they computed a full Merkle tree at every recursion step. Uh, so they, they used Poseidon because they later proved Merkle paths in this tree. So they wanted that proof of a, Mer of a Merkle path is compact, it has, less, it has few constraints. But the fact that they had to compute this Merkle tree first uh, made a big overhead. So they, they spent, at the very beginning, they spent 99% of time uh, just computing this tree before they even proven anything about it. And this, of course, emphasizes that Poseidon as a, as a hash function, which you just compute on a CPU, is quite slow. So this 99% would never happen if they used a Shadow 56, for example, or, or Blake 2 or 3, of course. Yeah, I think this is a good time to maybe talk a bit about the requirements from hash functions, because we, we talk about a few different ones right now. And let's say, um, what are the requirements in different environments? But um, let's see maybe the, what what is their usefulness in in different places. So we talked about the Zcash use of it, right? Uh, when they were using for set from set membership in um, with the Miracle Tree, and if we recall, like when 2016 before Poseidon existed and all that, that that was most of their proof, it was like 40 seconds and most of it was computing SHA-2 hashes. And basically one of the biggest breakthroughs that they had was when they moved to Sapling was switching it to a Pedersen hash. Uh, which is interesting because that construction is actually not really symmetric crypto anymore. So what's what's like the basic difference between them? Like, why wouldn't you use that one everywhere, right? I think they faced quite a complicated trade-off. So one a clear requirement that you have there is, of course, the security of a hash function. So you, you must not be able to find a collision or worse enough, pre-image uh, faster than, uh, for example, two to the 128 operations if uh, you declare a security level of 128 bits. And uh, this security requirement is actually quite well defined. So you, you don't have to think about a particular zero knowledge proof system or a specific usage of a hash function or to figure out if, if your hash function is secure or not. So it actually even doesn't matter much in which 
uh, hardware, you compute your hash function because, okay, there's a difference of like maybe even a factor of thousand, but this clearly doesn't affect the security if we talk about two to the 128 operations or something like this. So the security is like very well defined and one clear requirement is that the hash function must be secure. So one reason why Zcash uh, selected the so-called Pedersen hash is that the security of this design, it stems from a number theory problem of the security of discrete logarithm. And uh, this is in some sense uh, better than the security of a regular hash function, which we don't reduce to any like popular assumption but the security of a popular hash function uh, stems from uh, how we call it public scrutiny, that an ability of the entire world of cryptanalysts to break it for a long period of time. But other requirements are kind of more subtle. So the second requirement that, that came into application was clearly succinctness in circuits so that your hash function must be short enough. It, it should have a few constraints we would say so, but even this is not really well defined because what people really wanted is small prover time. But uh, the prover time is not by itself really well defined because it's somewhat depends on the number of constraints, but it also involves some other characteristics. In particular, when we talk about not proof systems like Growth16, but some more sophisticated like Plong, then you have to take into account gates, algebraic degree of polynomials that are involved, the number of columns, and so on and so forth. So the performance of a prover is really, really difficult to quantify here. So when we, for example, from the design standpoint, it's actually very difficult because on one hand, you want to design a hash function that could be used in many applications with many proof systems, but on the other hand, it turns out that a hash function that is good for one proof system is not that good at the other proof system. So for like for the design point of view, it's both good and bad. If you design a hash function just for a single proof system, it doesn't allow you to publish your uh, hash function at a really top conference because people will be less interested. Right. That's the trade-off of optimization. As soon as you optimize for something, then you optimize for one use case and not for the others. But yet, to follow up on what could be mentioned, it's funny if you take someone from the you know symmetric community and you ask them, give me the name of a one-way function. So they will think one way, hash function, they will say get sack, Blake, whatnot. If you take someone from the public key community, from the academic public key, they will think one-way function, well, discrete logarithm, uh, something like Pedersen hash. Because initially, if you look at the foundations of crypto, the concept of one-way function was defined uh, very theoretically and is instantiated by things like discrete logarithm, uh, was RSC is a trapdoor function. And I had discussions with people from that community telling me, oh, you know, I don't trust AES because there's no security proof. Yeah. And likewise, say, ah, we can trust just three because look at all this mess of bits and bytes shuffling, mm, doesn't look secure to me. But I think if there's one message to the audience here is that you don't need to worry too much. It's not that there is no proof or that it might be insecure. It's just that the construction doesn't lend itself to the kind of proof we know today how to design. In some sense, it's nice that you have like the, the biggest, um, let's say, bug bounty out there. Right, for these hash functions in the form of cryptocurrencies, right? Exactly. The proof is in the pudding, you know. Um, yeah, and there's also the topic of, let's say, quantum resistance that maybe some hash functions at least are plausibly should stand better against. And that's a good question because when it comes to signatures only, you can always wait for the hypothetical day when we have a quantum computer and just switch back to switch to post quantum signatures. But in the case of privacy preserving proof systems, it's different because you might be able to, to open the previous transactions the day you have a quantum computer. So it might be a more pressing use case for post-quantum. So if you take things like stocks, they are post-quantum mostly. Can you tell me like currently what hash functions are primarily used? You've, you've mentioned a few of them, like the SHA-256, like in ZK systems, 
are there some standards that people seem to gravitate around that they do feel like they can trust them, they have the right properties? What would you say like today with the new systems, like what is the most common hash function being used? From my perspective, having seen a lot of projects, a lot of code bases, a lot of audits that I did, Poseidon is the clear winner here. Uh, what well, Poseidon is, Poseidon is not one single hash like Blade 2, it's a family a framework to design hash functions. You can tweak the number of rounds, change the, the finite field, but ultimately the same design family. Yeah, I, I clearly see Poseidon as the, the main hash function today in terms of implementation, in terms of deployment. But. Cool. You were just talking though about like how they're battle tested. You're sort of like, you put them out there, it seems like, and you're waiting for someone to break them. But are you doing some sort of formal check? Are you sending it to peers being like, please break. Like, I'm just curious, like when you put it out there, it seems really scary because you're like, it's good until it's not. Why would people trust it? Yeah, that trust is important. Trust, you know, it takes a number of signals starting with who designed it, starting with how the specs look. But there is no, you know, when we talk about symmetric crypto or hash functions, the ones we're discussing today, we don't have complete security proofs because the question is, what is security? It's collision resistance, the randomness, indistinguishability, second parameter resistance. So it's very hard to have you know, a comprehensive proof. However, what we do have is proofs for specific classes of attacks. And in particular, bounds, complexity bounds on the harness of doing certain types of attacks, such as certain classes of differential attacks. And if you, if you look at the Poseidon paper, I think most of the paper is devoted to explaining, arguing, why the design is not vulnerable to certain types of attacks, including the algebraic attacks, which are maybe the most relevant for Poseidon. And once you have this kind of assurance that, let's say, you know, four rounds of your function will be safe, then you add some additional computation, what we call security margin, in case someone finds a much better attack. But that's if your function is completely new. If 10 years later, there is no single attack, no single incremental improvement, Maybe it means that function is not too bad, but the problem is that people are reluctant to reduce the number of, of rounds. And that's why I, I did this paper called Too Much Crypto, where I said that, you know, we could save a lot of energy on this planet if instead of doing 20 rounds of cha cha, we, we did half of it. Uh, but it's almost like the, the case of like flight and airplanes, where it's like you have to have so many redundancies. You have to have so many backups. You have to have so many things exactly. in those odd cases that like someone yeah. finds a way to get through some of these barriers. Yes, defense in depth, additional security controls. And what scared me initially with you know, the blockchain world is that people design a new proof system, they code it, and the day after it's deployed and tons of value <laughs> is based on it. And it makes people from academia, <laughs> you know, crazy because in academia, historically, we would have to wait maybe 10 years and have many papers, many conferences about a cipher before using it. And now it's like, yeah, the proof is in the pudding. It's uh, we deploy it and hope, just hope for the best. It's very cowboy territory, feels like. Yeah, and I like it because, you know, it's the ultimate test. There might not be academic papers at EuroCrypt, but you know that if people break it, they can steal one billion dollars. Like, like Kobe said, the best bounties in the world in a way. Exactly. Um, you talked also, Dimitri, about like breaking some of these yourself. So like in the design of these, do you learn how to do them mostly from breaking the other ones? Yes. Like, is that part of the process of building hash functions? Yes, yeah, sort of. So, well, some people are born with the capacity of designing good things, but most of others, they actually learn from breaking. So... You're kind of supposed to break things uh, several times before you learn how to design a good one. And uh, indeed, so after you participated in a few cryptanalysis paper, you can try to design something, something good. And of course, these uh, competitions, uh, they play really a major role as uh, only the, the very best uh, designs survive. Actually, I would like to add to the uh, previous uh, comment by JP about uh, also too much crypto. Indeed, some uh, cryptographers are scary of not only of modern hash functions, but also of older hash functions that they don't have a security proof. 
but here we would add that uh, these hash functions are usually should not be considered just as black box. So they, uh, when we mention some number of rounds, this rounds means that the hash function is built as a sequence of more or less identical components. And the history of design and analysis, it uh, uh, shows us that usually how attacks progress, you, you break like more and more of this number of rounds um, until you, you reach uh, the full hash function. So this kind of uh, playing with the number of rounds is not uh, exactly what you have like in airplanes, but it's more like selecting, for example, uh, a width of a wall when you design a skyscraper. So it was figured out like 150 years ago how much uh, concrete uh, you should put uh, into a wall if you build like a 100 meter up uh, skyscraper. And you know that there is some kind of a security margin there. Uh, like you, you could have like 20% less and I'm pretty sure it will stand because there must be security margin. Yeah, there. but is, is it normal concrete or reinforced concrete? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Reinforced concrete. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I just, I'm just realizing where you're getting that name from. Um, we will talk about that shortly, the reinforced concrete, yeah, I, which is... I'm actually curious about when you talk about the, this, this kind of lineage of, you know, how to design hash functions. You, you've designed Poseidon, right? Like in, you're talking about the kind of properties and the kind of analysis that you've made and the attacks that you've shown that you're not vulnerable. J JP, you mentioned like that Dimitri in the paper has shown that a list of attacks are basically not applicable uh, to Poseidon or to the family of functions, let's say. And I'm curious because Dimitri, you mentioned that even the hash function that was this AA, AS best one that the Tark's paper uh, worked on, weren't they doing the same analysis? Or even in the in the short time where algebraic hash function functions were worked on, there were even some some of those that were broken. We saw that in your talk in ZK Summit 8, right? So weren't they doing the same analysis or were you coming up with new attacks or how, how did that work? Uh, well, in some, in some cases, they indeed did not do pretty much the same analysis. Okay. Uh, but also in some, other, in some other cases, like when you break things, usually you break something that has not been broken before. So you, you seek as a cryptanalyst, you seek for a place which is like the most novel, the, le the least explored, and to try to find the bug there. You try to find a mistake, uh, like people decided to use something new, so they kind of, they design a new hash function, there must be something new there. Yeah. So it depends, you can use like 90% of old and 10% of the new, and then as a designer, you concentrate your kind of analysis of this new 10%. And this, of course, makes the cryptanalyst job much harder because like much, much smaller attack field. But uh, uh, what was in the Stark paper and with some early algebraic hash designs that they uh, had to do something almost completely new. They had very little to uh, rely upon. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we had like quite a few places where uh, you, could, you could try to find uh, a problem with. And because of that, kind of breaking them was kind of somewhat easier. So it still requires a little bit of art, like intuition, where you can, where you should expect a problem. But when you design something completely new, there is of course very big room for for bugs. Like when people started building like railroad bridges, they they fell like every second year because it was something completely new. You never built a bridge for such a heavy thing like a train. But since then, people have learned. And now we, have, we can design algebraic hash functions like improving upon Poseidon and we, we can build upon its security uh, so that like we can introduce like yet another uh, component which can be the only novel thing compared to the previous designs. And then we can concentrate our own analysis on this component. And then cryptanalysts will concentrate their analysis on this component because they, they know it will be very hard to find some problem in uh, the parts that have been battle tested. Yeah. So, like when you when you write Poseidon, you 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 say, you know, I covered all the attacks that I know about and that all the community knows about, but that should give you this much confidence. Like, 
you should still work really, really hard to attack this. So I think there are two reasons, if I'm the devil's advocate here, maybe two reasons that make people nervous for getting algebraic hashes. The first one is that all cryptanalysis is based on finding patterns, finding structure like mathematical structures or behavior that we're not aware of as a designer, because your goal as a designer is to break any correlation, any mathematical structure, any symmetry in the input or in a set of inputs so that the outputs all look random and uncorrelated for whatever type of correlation. And the challenge is that if you use algebraic hash functions, you use algebraic groups, you use algebra, you use math, you use yeah. structures. And the question is, could we leverage some of these very structure to, to break the hash? And which brings me to the second point that there's a class of methods called, uh, um, well, equation solving and specifically with the Grubner basis techniques. And these are classes of methods where it's very hard to predict the complexity of the computation. You're like, okay, I have a bunch of equations. And if I want to break the hash, I just have to solve these equations but you don't get directly an estimate like you need to do the 10 hundred operations or whatnot. It's mostly empirical. So as, as soon as there is uncertainty, people can speculate and say, oh, what if, yeah, but you know, what if we find some solvable equations? Uh, and all the challenge is to demonstrate that these attacks will not, will not work. Cool. Dimitri, do you agree? Yes, uh, yes, I, I certainly agree. So this, uh, there is indeed this problem that the best algebraic attacks well, they kind of fall into two categories. There are like more known attacks like interpolation without going into details. It's just basically a solving of an equation with one variable. And we kind of know how to solve equations with, with just one variable. So all this algorithm of uh, solving polynomial one, one variable equations are well known, their, com their complexity are well known. But when we're talking about multiple variables, then uh, the best algorithms are much less understood. They are very ad hoc. So the best algorithms for Grubner basis, they are not described as like compact algorithms. They're described as a series of papers or worse enough, they exist only as pieces of code in uh, proprietary systems like Magma. And because of that, of course, it's difficult to trust that they will not improve significantly. So I think from the theoretical point of view, all this equation solving is in the complete and you can't have like a generic solver, which is super fast. But uh, in particular cases, it, it may be super fast. And the fact that we don't understand this algebraic uh, Grubner basis algorithms really well, and we don't, we, we don't have good mathematical machinery to uh, estimate their complexity, it, it makes people somewhat, somewhat nervous that we rely when we select this number of rounds, we, we rely on complexity estimates that may be off in, in any direction. So they can be off in like, actually they are worse. The complexity is much higher, which essentially means that your hash function can be faster or worse, uh, the complexity is, is, is lower. And this means that your hash function uh, is less secure. Well, kind of evidence now, and like there is consensus that the complexity of this algebraic attacks is underestimated, that their real attacks are more expensive. They require more memory, uh, not only like computation time, but they're also like memory uh, hard, this, this attacks, so that the actual complexity is probably higher than we expect. And this gives the, like extra confidence, but this of course is not like uh, the level of confidence we, we had in the designs from the past, like SHA-2 or AES. And you remember the attack that broke AES in I think, 2002? So a guy came up uh, with this paper, like, AES is broken! That's the end of the world! You know, repent! Because uh, AES, the AES block cipher is moderately algebraic. And this guy, he had this paper, he was very optimistic, and he said, I could break AES by solving equations. But he had no evidence, no proof of concept. <laughs> he tried to publish the paper, and that a lot of people, you know, demonstrated that it was very optimistic, uh, to be polite. Uh, but there were a line of attacks on the AES that use what Dimitri mentioned, linearization, uh, algebraic attacks, Grubner basis, but it didn't go anywhere. It's like, oh, we just have these equations. We just have to solve yeah, the equations. <laughs> oh, but that's harder yeah. than expected. <laughs> uh, 
Because <laughs> everything can be, you know, yeah. expressed as equations. You know? So maybe it's good to start describing how algebraic functions or algebraic hash functions look like, um, because we we understand that, that they're so much more efficient for ZKPs. But what's what's so special about them? Like what what their structure looks like and what's interesting about them? Uh, okay, maybe I should uh, try to explain in a little bit how Poseidon works. Yeah without uh, drawing anything, without involving any math. So the idea is that there is an input message that you want to hash. And how it works, uh, you interpret this message as uh, a series of field elements. If you are working in the prime field, so suppose like there are uh, two field elements, you want to hash and get one field element as an output. So basically you compress two into one. Like a milk tree, let's say. Like a Merkle tree, exactly. Uh, so how you do it, you to prevent one specific attack, you do a, you can construct a state not of two elements but of three elements, and you set the third element to be equal to zero. Uh, then what you do is that you apply very uh, simple uh, transformations to this state. So you have like three field elements. So what you can do with field elements, you can, for example add one to another, you can multiply one by a constant, you can exponentiate uh, one to some power. And of course, exponentiation ex is expensive mm -hmm. in both uh, circuits and plane performance. So what we do, we just ex exponentiate to something uh, which is invertible, because clearly if you exponentiate and this, this transformation has collisions, then the full hash function will have collisions. So what you do, for example, you exponentiate to the power of five because five is usually uh, co-prime with uh, the field size, uh, minus one. So what you do is that you uh, permanently mix elements of the state. You just add uh, one element to another with some uh, coefficient. You basically, if you, if you like thinking about it as uh, vectors and matrices, then your state is a vector and you multiply it by a matrix of coefficients. You multiply it by a matrix of coefficient and then you exponentiate, you don't actually have to exponentiate all of them into some power, you exponentiate just one of them into some power. Just take one element and to uh, compute the uh, fifth power of it. So you multiply the state by a matrix, you take a fifth uh, exponent of uh, one element. Multiply by a state by a matrix, you take, uh, uh, you exponentiate one element to the power of five. So what you get eventually is uh, after making the sufficiently many rounds, is that uh, you still get a function uh, and of the resultant state, you take one element. Doesn't matter which one, suppose you can take first. Then uh, you cannot really invert it because you cannot uh, figure out what the rest of elements are and you cannot uh, make them just arbitrary elements because when you invert it back, uh, you will not uh, face uh, a single zero element that you have put in the state in the very first iteration. Um, and uh, the property that we want for this to be secure is that the resulting function has so-called high algebraic degree. And what actually happens is that if you uh, take one element and compute the power of five, uh, then you have like x to the five, then you mix it with other elements and if you compute again, uh, if you exponentiate it to the five, then you will have an equation of degree uh, five times five, 25. After doing it one more time, you have an equation of degree 125 and so on. So you, you just make it grow uh, till the time when you can't possibly solve. So because if you want to find the collision or a pre-image to, to the hash function, what you just have to do is to solve a polynomial equation, and you just make it grow to the uh, to the threshold where you know you can't solve a polynomial equation of this big degree, and this degree is something like again to the 128, and from this, since degree grows more or less by the factor of five every time, you can easily calculate how many rounds uh, you need. Grubner basis attacks they uh, come from interpretation of this process separately. Like you look into individual rounds, they all of, you say it like polynomial describing they're all of degree five, and then you make this system of equations of degree five uh, into a single system, and then you try to find the so-called Grobner basis. Well, mm -hmm. 
Let's bet not to talk what exactly Grobner base is. Yeah. Some kind of a set of polynomials that kind of divide every polynomial from a system. But what's important there is that as the number of rounds grows, it also increases the complexity of these Grobner basis attacks because what happens is that you have to solve bigger and bigger uh, set of equations. And this makes at some point, again, these Grobner basis attacks inapplicable. So when you design a hash function, when you select a number of rounds, what you simply do, you just increase this number of rounds till the point where uh, both the degree is very high and uh, the estimated Grobner basis attacks are also of high complexity because like too many equations. And it's actually the same because uh, people say, yeah, there's algebraic hashes and non-algebraic. But if you look at SHA2 and the like, they work with bits. They work with GF2, finite field elements. And you can describe Poseidon in terms of GF2 elements. You can describe SHA256 in terms of any finite field element because of the universality of equations. You just end up with more equations. So it's not that you obtain a strange, presumably less secure function with one technique or the other, is that the representation uh, that we use to read the spec to code is, is different and has to be succinct because the underlying equations are exponentially large. This is interesting, but like, or I think it's starting to answer a question I've had for a little while since you've been speaking, which is sort of the rounds. We didn't really explore rounds that deeply. Like you've mentioned them a few times. I have a question about them. Like, are they all the same? Like every time you're doing it, are you always doing the same thing? Or are you doing a different thing in different rounds? Well, they, they are a little bit different. So, and this kind of little bit difference is sort of a protection against certain types of attacks. So they're like, there is one class of attacks that exploits the fact if all the rounds are exactly the same. Uh, basically, the exploitation is pretty much similar that you can uh, like apply one round to the input and you apply one round to the output, and then you still get like uh, a valid transformation. That's a so-called slide, slide attacks. What you're saying is like every round can be slightly different and you're, you have these techniques to attack it and you're adding extra rounds so that it just sort of gets out of the range of that attack technique. But I do wonder, like, are new techniques always being introduced as well? New attack techniques that can, like, handle more rounds? Like, it seems like there's sort of two races. Like, how secure can you make this? How many rounds can you add? Or how well can you add variety into the rounds so it's super hard to track versus these attacks that, like, you mentioned one repeatedly, but, like, could there be another one that's like in development right now? So there are some classes of attacks that well, Dimitri knows very well. Is the, the attacks that try to walk around the number of rounds. For example, what we call a meet in the middle or rebound attack. We exploit the round structure to kind of bypass, so to speak, certain rounds. But ultimately, the more rounds you have, the more security. So if you have like an infinite number of rounds, it should be fine. Unless you have attacks like the slide attacks that Mitri mentioned, unless you have a structural weakness. But then you have a different design uh, paradigm, which is what Reinforced Concrete is doing. You have two main components of a round, and you have one very different um, type of round that provides another property. Because we don't design rounds randomly, there are different properties we want to achieve. There's what we call vertical security and horizontal security, uh, also called confusion and, and diffusion. Because you can be very solid in one direction, have very high degree of your equations, mm -hmm. but you want equations that not only have a high degree, but equations that mix many of the input, many of the components. So equations that are quite dense and that combine each component together. Okay. But you want all these combinations to have a high level of solidity, uh, so to speak, so which mm. translates into algebraic degree. But are you also, like in designing these, trying to reduce the number of rounds? This is the feature that I'm not really understanding in what you're describing. Cause like what I just, just heard is like, well, we added enough rounds so that they can't touch it. But yeah. Is there also pressure to make less rounds? Like that's what you were talking about earlier, right? JP, you were saying that like, that's why do we have all these rounds? We should just get rid of some of the rounds. Yeah. But I got quite some pushback because it, it was often quite emotional arguments. It was, you know, kind of what if arguments, but then, you know, now with the applications we have, there are some applications where you don't really care about maybe a 50% speed up, but at scale, uh, where every nanosecond counts in a, I don't know, big cloud systems, 
uh, it can have a tremendous impact if you optimize the speed of, of your hash. And now it's even amplified further in the ZK proof systems because of the order of magnitude of the overhead of the circuit process. I, I remember that very strongly. Like when, when we were working on deploying uh, MIMC, even like we were choosing the number of rounds from MIMC. The general guidance is, you know, take a security margin, like add 20% more rounds, you know, why not, right? Oh, wow. It adds a performance over it in two places, both when you create a proof, like when you compute hashes, when you compute the Merkle tree, but also when you need to use the tree itself in the smart contract. And that, that becomes very costly and very expensive. Um, so that's, uh, that's annoying. And that actually brings me back to the performance discussion because you you mentioned that you know this is really nice when you design functions like Poseidon because you work on field elements and then you do let's say low degree exponentiations and some arithmetic operations and that's very efficient in a circuit right like because circuits works really well with arithmetic operations at least the popular ones Crot 16 Plong. They work really nicely with those, um, but something led you to to design reinforced concrete, right? Which targets a different trade-off. A little bit, yes. So I would say that well, if we first talk about this number of rounds again, I would say that like in the design process, this selection of the number of rounds is not that difficult. So how it works usually, well, how it's for example it's happening right now in in our team. Uh, designers, uh, we are thinking, so we have like some starting point, like I, I say, okay, I have starting point, so let's have this round and let's iterate it for like 10 times. Let's have 10 rounds of, of this kind. And uh, I say, well, we need 10 rounds because uh, the security will be sufficient against the attack. We, we know against the attack we have developed during the course of this design and someone else says, for example, GP says, okay, I have a different round structure, so it will be like 20% faster. And I reply, well, okay, it will be 20% faster, but what about the security? So if we, if we use the same 10 rounds, will it be equally secure? And he says, well, not exactly. The security will be like 30% less. So we would, have, we would have to have not like 10 rounds, but 13 rounds. So for to have the same security, and we we realize that from a performance point of view, even if like every round is somewhat faster, uh, we need more of them so that like eventually uh, the new design, the, like the second version, will be slower. So say, okay, well this probably will not work out, but maybe we can combine the the best of the worlds. Can we have something like the better one? And then we like think and think further, and eventually we select something that is like fast enough and, and secure. So we kind of gradually uh, increase the, the performance uh, while still having uh, sufficient security. I want to ask something, like we've mentioned reinforced concrete a few times. I don't know if the listeners are familiar with the work, but does reinforced concrete, is that like an add-on to Poseidon or is it like a different category? Is it a new hash function? Like, is it is it just like a different place? Well, why, one might say that in Poseidon, so this number of rounds is quite, quite big. So we have like more than 60 rounds. And this is exactly because we need this algebraic degree of a function to grow uh, up to some needed level, up to like 200, 2 to the 128. Reinforced con concrete tries to replace 90% of Poseidon with just one new round. Oh. So instead of like, we take like 60, 60 out of 65 Poseidon rounds and replace it with one round with, which potentially has the same algebraic degree. Just the round itself is very different. From this point of view, it can be seen like an advance, uh, like a ne very next version of Poseidon. But kind of from the design point of view, from the analysis, this new round that we introduced, it's of course, the very kind of fruity target for, for cryptanalysts. So we, we can't recommend it for usage immediately because like, of course, every single cryptanalyst in the world, when, she, when he sees it, uh, they immediately go and try to break this particular new addition in the design. Well, I have a question to you, Dmitry. I think these tricks are actually what they do in reinforced concrete is 
let's say, br completely break the symmetry, break the structure by using an operation that has nothing to do with the under underlying mass structure. But the problem is that since it has nothing to do with it, it's way much slower to compute. Well, if you work with finite fields. So my question, Dimitri, did you think of this trick in this design Poseidon? And if yes, why did you discard it? I think we did not uh, because we couldn't find a way to uh, describe it uh, in constraints and like R1CS constraints that we worked at that time. So at that time, I was not when we designed Poseidon, I wasn't familiar with other uh, ZK proof systems. So while well, I was aware of Starks, uh, but still in Starks, you can have like not an R1CS constraint, but almost an arbitrary polynomial expression, but it's still about like multiplications. And I had no way kind of, uh, we, we couldn't design, couldn't devise a way uh, to break this algebraic structure because we didn't know how to efficiently implement it in a circuit. And we were also were familiar with one such attempt that was exactly in this Friday design that we broke that the guys exploited some similarity between uh, binary fields based on, on bits and binary fields as uh, like uh, polynomials. And we were afraid of, of using this kind of tricks and that's why at the time of Poseidon, we didn't go for it. But the time, uh, everything has changed when we learned about uh, ZK proof systems that could use lookups and this gave us kind of extra tool to start with. I have a very practical question. How should people choose parameters? Because, you know, when you use SHA2 and like all these traditional old hash functions, you have test vectors, you have very accepted and known designs that people use and can test against. But with Poseidon and others, you have all of these constants that you have to choose then you have to derive and all that. Are there any standards or any efforts to gather the community around? Not much, and that's a big risk. Oftentimes, I did code reviews of this kind of, uh, you know, custom Poseidon, and there were not as vectors to compare against your implementation. So what, what ground truth do you use? Uh, so what some people do is that they abstract out Poseidon as you know, a framework working with arbitrary finite fields, and they implement it for a known instance of Poseidon. This specific finite field is number of rounds, and they check that they have the same output as the other implementation. And then they just customize their new design to work with different parameters, uh, which gives them some assurance that they are doing the right thing. But we, we've seen some, even in Poseidon, some small mistakes like you know, getting the matrix vector product incorrectly or things like this. Are, are there like risky parameter choices? Like what, what can go wrong? Well, if you make too few rounds, of course, then it's more, it's more in the usage of the hash, how you use it, if you hash multiple inputs, how you combine them. I think there, there is one uh, vector that can be like realistically dangerous. So in Poseidon, we use matrices to, uh, we use a single matrix to multiply a uh, vector. Uh, and it's possible to uh, make this, uh, to design this matrix insecurely uh, so that there are some invariant subspaces there. So when you exponentiate this matrix, it, it has not a full rank at some point. And uh, kind of reference Poseidon matrices, they don't have this problem, but if you generate them uh, randomly, there is kind of non-zero chance and kind of non-negligible chance you do it wrongly, so you, you have to just make a, a simple check for, for, for it. So there is, uh, in the reference implementation of Poseidon, there is a simple script that will check your metrics that it doesn't have this uh, vulnerability. I think the paper describes it too. Yes, yes, and uh, there is a paper that attacked this uh, non non reference matrices, and they sh they show that uh, there can there can be a problem. So this is actually this attack that we, that we missed when when we designed a hash function. So this attack we didn't we didn't think about properly. But fortunately, the default matrices we we supplied they didn't have this vulnerability. Okay, that that that's lucky. And um, when when you 
choose the, the coefficients or the elements in this matrix, do they also affect the performance somehow or they just completely random and they don't matter for performance? I think they do affect the performance, uh, but it's possible to, to select them uh, as small constants. So this is not a reference version. I think in the reference version, they are like big prime field elements, but it's possible to make like them- Like they're safe in the reference Yeah, version. yeah, but it's possible to make them small. Actually, we have, uh, we can select uh, some submetrics of the AES uh, block cipher, mm. and they have like efficiency three, two, one, and so on. And it, it will be most likely, okay, you just have to check it with the script. So we didn't see kind of this, when, when this becomes a bottleneck, so it may be a bottleneck in some circumstances. So you can, you can make metrics multiplication a little bit more uh, optimized. So in the, in the sort of hash function world, what else is happening and maybe what do you see on the horizon? So I would say like, uh, indeed, with the introduction of MIMC, Poseidon, uh, Rescue Friday and other designs for the ZK world, the attention of cryptanalysts and designers has somewhat shifted uh, to these uh, new hash functions because they look like low hanging fruits uh, for many ones and people are somewhat tired of attacking the old designs. There's not much happening down there. And what becomes interesting, I think, uh, is the development of new zero knowledge proof systems. Uh, because if you design a hash function tailored to a particular zero knowledge proof system, it can become really, really fast. For example, if you take Poseidon and try to optimize it for Plonk, if you, uh, for example, design IOP, which uh, handles just this Poseidon circuit, you can make a prover like 10 times as fast compared to a regular Plonk prover uh, with the Poseidon. And I think uh, what we should expect in the near future is that the design of hash function tailored to some specific applications where some novel uh, proof systems are used. So new proof systems appear like almost every month. We have Nova, for example. We have new lookup arguments like, like Colk and, and its relatives. And we should expect that there will appear hash functions that will make use of operations that are admissible in this, in this proof systems and that try to optimize themselves further and further to be used only in some like very limited set of proof systems, but still uh, they will be fast enough. The problem of course with it is that it will be difficult to cryptanalyze them because we might have too many different hash functions for any new, every new application we might have a new hash function. It's, this is of course bad because we can't afford sufficiently number, sufficiently many cryptanalysts to look into this hash function and uh, they will be much less battle tested. And it sounds like there's no standardization in that case. So you don't get sort of that confidence that you're looking for. Exactly. Because the proof systems evolve so quickly, we can't have a standard there. And because we can't have standard there, we can't have a, a standard hash function because hash functions will try to catch up with the development of new proof systems to be like fast and tailored for them. But this, of course, we will have this trade-off between performance and uh, cryptanalysis that we can have like much, has, much faster hash function, but uh, the amount of third-party cryptanalysis we have for this hash function will be smaller. What about you, JP? Yeah, you guys covered, uh, you covered quite a few points I had in mind as well regarding standardization. As Mitra mentioned, we can expect to see different hashes optimized for their use cases because unlike you know, general purpose hash functions, that's a field where, first of all, there's a lot of competition between projects, uh, all the projects we know, and where every single small incremental speed up has a meaningful effect on the user experience, on the cost, on the cost in terms of gas and, and the like. So even though Poseidon is kind of the de facto standard now, we can expect people to optimize it for every single use case that they have. But it doesn't mean we're not going to have a kind of standard, semi-standardized way or framework to build hash functions. I think we'll probably converge to maybe a handful of designs and then we'll hit diminishing returns and people will stop working on new designs. Um, 
Which brings me to another point, um, maybe at ZK8, at the ZK8 Summit in Berlin, there was this great talk by Omer Shomovitz about uh, hardware optimization, uh, hardware implementation. And I know that the choice of a hash is quite important when you have to design uh, hardware, to create hardware design, because you have to settle on a hash at some point, and you have to worry maybe at some point about interoperability, because we see many people were using the same code, the same Poseidon code, we also see people who just re-implement stuff for the sake of it, but maybe there will be some, you know, vested interest in using the same tools at some point. Um, and also, so we briefly touched the topic of reinforced concrete. I think there's a lot of potential in the, um, the trick that Dimitri and his colleagues are using to have this component that is breaking the symmetry. And the challenge, challenge here is to estimate uh, what security you gain from it and how to do something that is relatively fast or not too slow to implement as a circuit or whatever constraint system you, you use. So, I mean, no offense to Poseidon, but I expect that this kind of design will manage to outperform Poseidon-like designs uh, if we know how to do it right. And the great thing is that it will go faster than in the purely academic environment because people will just deploy something and then Darwinism. So. <laughs> then someone will break it or not. Right, yeah, <laughs> or not. Yeah, I think to to be completely honest, I think that uh, one thing that would make a difference in order to get this actually happening would be to get the tooling for deploying local-based systems more practical. That's just hard to do today, but uh, it's getting there. So that's nice. Cool. Dimitri, you did a talk at the ZK Summit 8 and JP, you did a workshop. I'm going to have both of those videos up by the time this podcast airs. So I'll definitely add those links in the show notes if people want to explore a little bit more of the work you're doing. And I want to say a big thank you for coming on the show and sharing with us what's happening in hash function land and also letting me ask a bunch of questions I clearly needed to ask to better understand how this works. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much for inviting us, Anna. Well, thank you, Anna. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for talking about hash functions. It was super interesting. Yeah, so thanks a lot. And thank you for being our 250th episode guest. This is kind of an, an exciting one. I want to say a big thank you to the podcast team, Tanya, Henrik, and Rachel. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks.